This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Hello and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices, the only program here in America that you, the viewer, can express your concerns and tell your stories about the child welfare system and family court system. I'm Dennis Lawrence and beside me is Maria Malin. Maria, we, uh, what do we got up first for us? Today on the show we have Haley, we're going to have Haley's dad and his aunt and We'll just, we'll go to that video and show you the injustices that have taken place in this case. Hello and welcome to Silent Voices. Today we are here with Matthew Marble, who is a father, and we are also here with his aunt, Bobby Dubois, and their attorney, Connie Regally. We just want to thank you for being on the show today. Thank you for having us. It's our pleasure. So, I understand this is kind of a complicated case. Um, you have a daughter, and can you tell us a little bit about her? Her name is Haley Stuber. She's going to be four August 8th, and she was born August 8th, 2012. When, on the day she was born, I spent at least seven days in the hospital, and, you know, I got to feed her and well, actually, you know, get a chance to be a dad. Right. Uh, well, it, it came to the point where I needed to ask for a visitation, and... I'm sorry, I'm getting a little choked up. Uh, That's okay, take your time. It got to the point where I needed to ask for visitation because, you know, me and her mother weren't really getting along anymore. So then I went down to visit her in Tennessee for the first time. This is a little bit of a step ahead because I did visit her in Michigan beforehand. Okay. And she stayed with me for a week. We'd watch TV, you know, I'd let my sisters hang out with her here and there. and feed her, change her diapers, and, well, like I said, went for visitation, and uh, a little bit, bef uh, probably a week or two beforehand, uh, she got abused, and she was removed from the mother because of, you know, the abuse, and, sorry. That's okay. Um. And that's when the court cases started. Okay. Um, Bobby, you've been pretty consistent in the baby's life and in Matthew's life. Can you tell me a little bit about um, what happened, why the child was actually removed, and what took place in that incident? So basically she was removed because of um, the child abuse. And uh, Matthew had a court hearing for his visitation. Um, a week after that had happened so he went up right away as soon as he heard from the mother's family that she was going into state care to go get her okay and I just wanted to clarify mm -hmm. for the viewers real quick this was not abuse that you were accused of doing this was abuse by by the child's mother is that correct that is correct and also it's speculation that possibly also the uh, boyfriend of the mother had had a part in it because she had lacerations on her face and you know for the viewers as well that's a bite mark on the right side of her head up in this forehead area and uh, bruises on her stomach and bruises on her face okay so normally in a situation like this in a court case if one parent is found to be abusing the child or not protecting the child from somebody who's abusing them they will give custody to the other parent. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened with that and why the child wasn't automatically transferred to, to dad's care? So actually as a family, we all found out about it. 
we had, um, Matthew had went to Tennessee um, with his mom. Um, they went there to go get her and he was on the birth certificate. He signed the voluntary acknowledgement of paternity. Um, there was no doubt he was <coughs> the father. Um, they actually even required him to do DNA testing, which he voluntarily did. Okay. Came back, he was the father. Um, and they just did not want to release her from foster care, which then we couldn't figure out that that wasn't right, why they weren't releasing her. And so then I called them and I said, you know, I'm a relative. We'd had relative placement before with some other family members, um, took care of the children until they could go back home. Uh, what do I need to do? And nobody wanted to help us. So I started going up the chain of command to find out who, um, what we needed to do and who could help us to find out why nobody wanted to help us and tell us what we could do for her. That was when I found out we needed to get licensed for foster care through um, the Upper Cumberland office is what they call it in Tennessee. Okay. Um, they said get your license for foster care, get your pride classes out of the way and stuff. So we did that immediately. And we got approved by the state of Tennessee. Um, it's called the Interstate Compact. So they came in, they checked our home, they did our license. Um, and then they sent it to Tennessee. Tennessee had to look over the interstate compact um, to see if they approved it. Tennessee approved it. We thought it was a go. And DCS, which they're called Department of Children's Services there in Tennessee, um, still would not release her to the family. Okay, and, and their attorney, Connie, again, is joining us on the phone. Connie, can I just ask you, what is, you know, based on your knowledge of um, DHS and that type of thing, is that pretty normal how they do things as far as getting a family member, you know, to take care of a child if they're willing to? Well, you know, I want to thank you for having a program like this for people who are really hurting and have really been caught in this horrible government, abusive government system can speak out. And and it's so, and you know, just even as I'm listening to them today, you can hear in their voices, especially Matt's voice and his attempt to describe what's going on, that as soon as this occurred, as soon as there was an issue where his child was abused and he took a step to try to do something about it, he got sucked into this system that, you know, nobody, it made no sense. And so... You know, most of the people who, who have watched your shows and who are beginning to understand what's going on really understand that this is a funding problem. And the funding issue is that the foster care system is, is, the, is the channel through which these child agencies re receive all their money. And so, therefore, they must have children in the foster care system. Now, just based upon what Matt has told you already, let me fill in a few of the gaps for you legally. Okay. So when Matt got, um, Matt, uh, the baby was conceived in the state of Michigan. And at, at the time the baby was conceived, both of them were minors, but the mother came back to the state of Tennessee and had the baby. On the very day or the day after she had the baby, Matt Marble signed a voluntary acknowledgement of paternity. Okay, so in the state of Tennessee, just as in probably all other 50 states, your signature on a voluntary acknowledgement of paternity is, is legal parentage. You do not have to do anything else. Your name goes on the birth certificate. Matt Marble was the legal father of this child the day she was born, the day she was born. And the United States Supreme Court has already ruled in Stanley v. Illinois that unwed fathers have just as much right to parent their child as the mother of the child or as, as a child born in wedlock. That has already been to the United States Supreme Court. We need to stop being challenged by that question. And yet what happened when this child was injured and she was swooped up into foster care and placed in a foster home, DCS filed a petition against this father saying he was not the legal father of this child because at the time that was the only thing they had against him. And so Matt was, you know, he was very young. 
He wasn't. He didn't know about the law. He didn't have really an advocate on his side who would stand up for him and support him. And so he got sucked into that system. That was in when they first filed against him was in September 2013. We are still fighting today, April 2016, three and a half years. We are still fighting because they did not do the right thing on day one. Right. And unfortunately, people generally learn about the system after they are directly involved in it, and that's got to change too. Yeah, and I want you, as we, and you know, if we have more contact after this and through your programs, I really want to talk about advocacy for parents and families. Now, let's move on to the relative placement issue. These federal funds have strings attached. And foster care is some of the strings attached, but oh, guess what? Relative placement is one of the other strings attached. And they are under federal law required to diligently search for relatives and to place with the relative. And Tennessee specifically is under a federal mandate that they are attempt to do a relative placement. And it's in their policy. So let's see, how many places in the law does it say relative placement? It says it under the federal law, under the capital law, it says you should look for relative placement. It says it under our state law, you should look for relative placement. It says it under the Brian A. Settlement Agreement, which is a federal mandate, and it says it in their policy. And they ignored every one of those because they wanted the child in foster care. Right. Yep, I agree fully. Um, just a question I have is is how what the hearings that were set up to try to get Matthew custody how did they fail it in like Connie's speaking of how did they fail in giving Matthew placement for that that you're aware of how was that okay that well happen? and that's a very good question because you know this whole system is is so uh, incestuous <laughs> Yeah. Everybody feeds off of the children in foster care, including court-appointed attorneys, including court-appointed attorneys. So when Bobby Dubois and her husband finally stepped up and said, we will be a relative placement, uh, again, under federal law, they're supposed to have that done in 60 days from the date of request until it's completed. It should have been 60 days. In 60 days, they should have been able to place with the relatives in Michigan, in the state of Michigan. This would have been done by December of 2000. 13. Here we are. We go to court in January 2014, and the judge says, oh, I'm sure Mr. and Ms. Dubois would make great parents for this child, and it's really great of them to step up and parent the child, but now this child has been in foster care for three and a half years, and I don't want to displace her. I'm like, what is this, a puppy? Is this a puppy? Because this is a child, and you know, again, under the United States Supreme Court decisions, the right of, to parent is also a familial right. It is a right for the child to have the preservation of their family as well it is, as it is the parent. And so Matt, who admittedly, admittedly, Matt, they started putting so many requirements on Matt. He had to do drug screens. He had to do a psyche valve. He had to do counseling. He had to, you know, have a full-time job. They put so many requirements on him. He would have had to walk out of the door of that meeting, get a $40,000 a year job, get an apartment on his home, hire a babysitter, because, of course, he would have to work if he was going to have the child, and prove to them that he was fit to be a parent. And, you know, Matt did the right thing, and he stepped up pretty quickly in this process and admitted he could not do it alone. And that has been his story since from the very beginning. He knew he could not do it alone, but he had family support. And that is what, you know, we have family versus foster care, and that's what it's boiled down to. Well, you know, and to me that seems like a pretty responsible thing to be able to look at a situation and say, hey, I need help. You know, this is a child, this is a person, and you're responsible for them. So I guess that is that kind of And that's absolutely me. true. And even when I, I, I mean, we have two court cases going at the same time. We have the dependency case and we have the termination case. And, of course, they made us do both of them at the same time, even though I tried to stop it. 
And, you know, instead they tried to stop me from having a court date on the dependency, you know, part of it. But very recently I was in um, front of the Court of Appeals on the termination. And, you know, and I even told that judge, I said he knew he couldn't do it alone. And when the state attorney stood up, I mean, I at least have to, you know, applaud that judge for at least asking one appropriate question. Who knows what they'll do when they write their opinion? But his question to the state was, doesn't a parent have a right to choose somebody to help them? Absolutely. Yep. And that was his question. And that has been his position from the, from the beginning. And, so, can... and, and, you know, how, does he, how did it happen? Well, they had, he had an incompetent attorney. You know, he had a competent attorney, and then they had a judge break the law. When when Bobby and her husband passed the ICPC, it should have been a done deal. Even though it delayed, it, you know, it took him seven months instead of 60 days, which is outrageous, outrageous. But even at the end of that, at that seven months when that ICPC came in, it should have been a done deal. DCS, the Tennessee Department of Children's Services, should have immediately transferred that child to Michigan and transferred their case if they wanted to keep the case open until the child could be stabilized in Michigan. But the judge said no. It wasn't the judge's decision. It was the department's decision. And they and that judge broke the law. So the, the, And who knows why the judge broke the law and preferred the child to stay in foster care. But who knows what's going on behind closed doors. But the judge broke the law as well. Right. Did you want to say something, Bobby? Yeah, I was just going to say that they always delayed everything, too. Like, they always pushed everything out for court hearings for um, basically, basically as much as they could to push it out and delay everything. Wouldn't you agree, Connie? Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. Whenever it was, well, they delayed everything when it was Matt was trying to get his story told. Mm -hmm. When the state wanted their case to go forward, you know, it was push, 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 push. You know, but they were successful. And here's another law that they broke. And, of course, they don't care. But when the, when the case first was filed, it was in, well, the, the first case against the mother was filed in June 2013. They didn't actually even bring a case against the father until September 2013. Well, according to the rules, you're supposed to have a hearing that's supposed to be heard within 30 days. And in the, in, under no circumstances should it extend 90 days. Instead right. of that, it took a year. Okay, so now we're to September 2014. So when the, the year came and the juvenile court judge said, no, you know, well, his incompetent attorney got him to stipulate that he was a, a neglectful and, you know, the child was dependent neglect against him. And so then, when they, that's when I came into the picture. So it's important to know that when I come into a case and it's already kind of gotten caught in the system, it, you know, it's very, I have a lot more trouble because they dig their heels in and they don't want to do the right thing. If I get into a case early, I have a little bit easier way to go. But... But the, I filed an appeal. As soon as I got a phone call from um, Ms. DeBois, I filed an appeal. September the 29th, we filed an appeal. We don't get a court date until April the next year. April the next year. Because the state delayed filing the order until January. And then the judge in the next court goes, well, you know, I just got that order, so uh, I've got another, you know, 45 days. Because they're supposed to do another hearing within 45 days of the juvenile court order. They broke that law. And right. then we get to, we get in the middle of our dependent neglect action and they file a terminate, they do a termination hearing on him. And then the state comes back when we're trying to finish our other hearing and they're like, judge, uh, we've already terminated his rights, it's over. And the judge is like, okay. And it takes me another eight months to get another hearing date. So it was from the time they filed against the father in September 2013, it was January 2014 before that petition was adjudicated. And that's when we sat in the courtroom and the judge turned to the, Ms. DeBois and her husband and said, I'm sure you all would make great parents for this child, but she's been with the foster parents for three and a half years. That is, that should be criminal. That is child trafficking. Yep. Yeah, absolutely it is. And I just wanted to real quick say to Matt, um, just a note on the earlier what we we're talking about is that you know kudos to you if this child's mom had said i can't do this alone your daughter may have never been harmed and i could only wish that she would have had that strength yep so that's you know despite what the court says that's a 
that is the best thing you can do for a child. Um, yeah, and let me tell you what else they did to Matt. They told him that because he knew she had used drugs, which is still debatable, but because she had used drugs once when she was two months pregnant, that he should then have known, he should have known that when his child was 10 months old, the mother was going to get so stoned and passed out and leave the child in the hands of somebody who would harm her. That he should have known that when she's 10 months old, and therefore he's guilty of failure to protect. And he lived three states away when this happened. Right. Yes, that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, just would like to quick ask you, um, Bobby, do you, can you tell me about, you know, the delays in this case? And I guess I'm just wondering, you know, if the child had been placed with you initially when there was a question, you know, and when it was discovered that mom was unable to take care of the child appropriately, do you think that the delays in the case has harmed your ability to bond for you and Matthew and the uncle to bond with the child? Absolutely. We were going to Tennessee. Um, we were helping to take Matt. So we'd go as a family to Tennessee every month, do our four-hour visits, um, spend time with her. We were able to, you know, bond with her and keep that bond. Um, they had cut um, visitation off with myself and the grandma. Um, so they could observe him parenting alone, which they knew he needed family assistance with. Um, so we had four months cut off, and then we got that started back up um, where we could continue to see her. And then once they did the termination of parental rights, um, he hasn't been allowed to see her since. And if I may, I would like to also add that it's been a good nine months that I haven't seen her and I can only imagine the way she would actually look at me now as to of every time I went to one of those visits, she'd always greet me with a smile and yell, Daddy, and come up and give me a hug. And I'm, I'm worried that it might not be that way anymore. That's a tough one, but I like to think that somehow you'll be able to salva salvage that bond. Um, you know, and start right where he left off. That is a tough one. Um, well, you know, talking about, Maria, the damage to children, the damage to children, it's just, it's unfathomable. It's unfathomable. I mean, honestly, it's so, you know, I, I think they can heal the bond, too. I mean, I'm an adoptive parent. My children were adopted from Russia when they were five, and so, you know, they spent five years <laughs> and right. never knew who I was. And, I mean, we haven't, incredible bond we have an awesome bond and and i'm very close to my children and i always tell my parents who are suffering from and families who are suffering from that separation you you know you can still have a bond don't you know don't give it up don't lose it because you're talking about haley's right to the heritage of her family you know you're talking about haley's right to know who her daddy and her aunt and uncle and her cousins and her you know her whole entire family system is i mean she's got that right and you're also fighting for that right because so many times i have parents who become so discouraged and so disgusted and <coughs> so hurt you know just it's so painful yeah. that you know they they turn away or they give up and it's and you have to keep them encouraged on that because we cannot let this win we cannot let them win this is child trafficking you know i'm sure you know on any given day of the year there are 400,000 children in the foster care system yeah. and when you multiply that times two parents and four grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins and relatives that they will never ever know who they've been cut off from in their life you're talking about millions of people if this is this is genocide this is family genocide right Matthew I know this puts you in a really tough position um, we're gonna come back for another episode but real quick can you let everybody know what you intend on doing and going forward I plan to continue to fight for as long as we possibly can to bring her home and with the help of Connie, I have high hopes that we can actually succeed. Okay. And you're going to be behind them the whole way? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. 
And, we and are- so let me just kind of let me just kind of tell you, just as a wrap up here, Maria, what our you know what that what that effort looks like. I mean, they have already terminated his rights. We've been to the court of appeals. We've had our oral argument on that. I am getting ready to file my. Um, appeal in the dependency action, and I can't wait to throw it in front of the court's face that, you know, the, the only reason they wouldn't give custody to the relatives was the three and a half year delay. So, you know, we are still in the appellate process, kind of fighting to overturn some of the things that they did in the uh, trial court level, and that's where we are right now, and, you know, I'm continuing to work diligently on that. Okay. Okay, well, Thank you for being here. We will be back um, in our next episode. Please join us again. If you would like to be a guest on Silent Voices, contact us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com. We'll be back after these messages. Thank each and every one of you for tuning in this week. You can catch us next week, same time, same channel. Until next week, my friends, remember, your, your voice, voice can, can make, make the, the difference. difference.